Scripture today is from Jonah chapter 4, verses 5 through 11. This completes the four chapters of Jonah that we've been looking at. This is from the voice translation. Jonah headed east out of the city instead of west toward his home to look for a place high above the city, meaning the city of Nineveh, to sit down. He found a suitable spot and built a shelter from the hot sun. He sat there waiting to see what might happen to the city. Then the eternal God chose a gourd plant to grow up and to shade Jonah from the discomfort of the intense heat. The large, thick leaves of this vine made Jonah very, very happy. But at dawn the next day, God chose a worm to chew through the gourd's vine, and that night it shriveled. Then when the sun rose, God chose a scorching east wind to blow. As the sun beat down from a cloudless sky on Jonah's head, he became faint. And again, Jonah asked to die. Jonah says, my death now is so much better than my life tomorrow. God says to Jonah, do you have any good reason to be angry about this gourd's vine? Jonah says, yes I do. I'm angry enough to die. God says to Jonah, Jonah, don't you understand? You care about this gourd's vine and yet you didn't do anything to make it grow. You didn't plant it, water it, or protect it. It appeared one night, then died another. Should I not have pity on that great city of Nineveh, where there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? May God add his blessing to the reading, the end here of chapter 4 of Jonah, <laughs> on this day. Some of what I love about the book of Jonah is the love and mercy that God has on us when our hearts are a mess. When our hearts are not where they ought to be, not at all in the right place, yet God has love and mercy for us. We have bitterness and anger. We are resentful. That's who we are as people many times throughout our life. You don't have to live very long to to get angry. You don't have to live very long to get bitter. You don't have to live very long to hate something. And, but when you do, God's love and mercy is right there for you. In fact, His grace will cover us like a cloak. It covers us. And the purpose of that is to change our heart. But, but more than that, is to change our disposition on how we feel about others and the situation. So God is looking to change our disposition. We use the word heart all the time. But he wants to change the way you view things, the way you view others, the way you view situations. And so this, this, this book of Jonah, I hope has, I know for me it's exposed some of my weaknesses, some of those things that I see myself like Jonah. Sometimes when I've gone the other way. Or when I've been mad that God didn't do it my way. Or when I've been angry and bitter and God chose to save me. Thank God we have a God of mercy. I thank God that I have a God of mercy. So, I hope you've been blessed by the prophet. As messed up as he is sometimes. So the fifth verse says, Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made a shelter. He sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city of Nineveh. It actually seems like Jonah doesn't believe that the Ninevites are repentant enough. And that because he doesn't feel like they're repentant enough, he's going to see if they're actually going to be saved. Now, Maybe he also, editorial, maybe he even wants disaster to come upon them. Uh, you know, these guys just aren't what they ought to be. You know, if they were like me. <laughs> but they're not like me. And so really, uh, they don't deserve God being merciful to them. I do. But they don't. Ever been there? 
ever believed that you deserved it, but they don't. I mean, after all, they don't blank. I, I do all these things if they only acted like me. Isn't it true that if all of us were in Washington, things would be a lot better, wouldn't they? Oh, yeah. I hear it every day. I even tell people, well, when I'm president, there'll be no commemorative stamps. Okay. Jonah, it appears, is waiting for disaster because he doesn't feel like these people are repentant enough. Yet, he's waiting. And so as he waits, in verse 6 then, then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow over Jonah to give him shade over his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was what? It says here, very, very happy about that. Jonah was happy that God had protected him from the sun. I really don't care what happens to those people over there, <laughs> but I'm feeling a lot better. See your pastor in that one? See yourself in that one? We see that God appoints this plan. See, Jonah had made what's called a booth in the Bible, made a booth. And his booth was, well, he didn't have the right leaves, not the right plant, so the sun was coming through it. And so really it was going to be very uncomfortable for him with that beating sun, cloudless sky. And so God sees that and says, you know, Jonah could have done a better job. He built a pretty shabby shelter. And so, because it's so shabby, I'm going to build a better one for him. So he has this gourd plant that grows over Jonah. And Jonah's what? Very, very happy. God is merciful to the disobedient prophet. Praise God for that. This disobedient prophet gets God's mercy, as we do sometimes when we're disobedient. We get God's mercy. And so it grows to cover him. And so we have this revelational mercy that God gives to Jonah and gives to us. We know that we seek cover. We seek mercy. We seek a time when God, we seek God's protection. And many times we're protected by God because He loves us and is merciful to us, even when we haven't asked for it. And we call that grace. The grace of God that covers us. And so sometimes when that happens, we bask in that enjoyment. We just bask in what God's grace has done for me. And so when, when we do that, we see it here in Jonah. He's enjoying what God has provided for him. We enjoy what God has provided for us. But we also have to recognize that God is merciful to me in spite of me. I do many things to really, you would think, prohibit God from being merciful to me. But he is anyway. Because he loves us. And so what happens? Well, we see what happens here. So, so but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm that chewed through the vine. It withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on. Any, other, any of you been in the Santa Ana winds? In, California, in Southern California, in the fall, um, there are winds that blow to the west. And they... They're about 85 to 90 degrees when that wind blows. So it's hot and they're blowing. And you even get uh, things in your mailbox saying about trimming your trees and making sure that things are, are you know, taken care of, that they won't blow away. Because the wind blows so hot and so hard. Um, it was the time when my sinuses went crazy every year in California. That wind would just, be, I mean, it would be a 20... 30, sometimes 40 mile an hour wind at 85 or 90 degrees. And it lasts for a couple weeks. And they're called the sand. And that's what I think of when I, that, that he was sitting up high in Southern California when the Santa Ana winds came through. That's what it, it makes me think of. And so the scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head that he grew faint and he wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Now he was just very, very happy. And now the wind's blowing and he's hot and he's going to faint. Oh, I'd rather die. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do. Jonah says, I do have a right to be angry. Ever, ever been there with God? Do you really have a right to be so upset at that? Yes, I do. Yes, I do have a right to be upset. We'll tell God. I'll tell you, God, I do have a right to be angry. And I do. And I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, 
You've been concerned about this vine. Though you did not tend to it, make it grow, didn't water it, sprang up overnight, died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left hand. And they have many animals. So God is saying to Jonah, maybe to us, here's the issue with you, Jonah. Here's the issue with you. Here's the issue with you, pastor. You have more compassion for your own needs being met temporarily than you have on the needs of others being met eternally. Woo! Anyone looking in the mirror on that one? We Westerners love to be taken care of. We love, is it good for me? Is it good for me? If it's good for me, I'm happy. But many cultures, many cultures, we get upset at them because they don't hold the same theological position as we do. And because they don't, we look about ourselves as we need to be taken care of because we're right. So God's going to assign some specific things to help us see where our heart is as a church body. And what it is is an act of love from God every time God brings circumstances together we say the stars are aligning and so God brings these circumstances together we say the stars are aligning to help heal our hearts there are times that God is at work in us and in other people aligning the stars so that we can help have a heart for healing of others instead of just being taken care of ourselves so we can look at our enemies with compassion and love instead of hatred and difficulty. Jonah, he faces his enemies. And what does he do? He hates them. He hates the Ninevites. Jesus came and faced his enemies. And he taught us to do what with our enemies? We love them. We are to love them. See, the truth without love is condemnation. The truth with love is compassion. That's what the difference is for us. We are to have the truth, but we're supposed to have the truth with love. And so love doesn't mean removing the truth, just being nice to people. We need to be truthful and be nice and careful. It's not just, just not being nice or polite. We need to be truth tellers about God. Our job is to make sure that our hearts, our disposition towards others is not one of being hateful and mean, but one of being compassionate and loving. And in today's society, compassion and love is difficult to come by sometimes. We see a lot of hatred. We hear a lot of hate spewed on the TV and on the computer, on different sites we go to. There's a lot of hate. But we need to be truthful and loving and compassionate and engage people in the midst of both religious and political criticism. There's a lot of criticism, but we need not our truth, small t, but God's truth, capital T. That's what, that's what the truth we're talking about. So by doing that, we would make the, the law of God the primary in our life because he loves us so much it can be the primary in our life I want to love others I want to go I want to proclaim the greatness of his love to as many people as possible there's a story in Luke 7 uh, Luke 7 is a you know, fairly long chapter it's got a lot of different stories in it but one here Jesus is invited by a Pharisee to the Pharisee's house now the Pharisees you could look at are well a little bit like us educated know the book only theirs was the Old Testament scripture. So the Pharisees are educated. They have some status. They're going to invite Jesus to the house. They know the scripture. And so somebody comes to the Pharisee's house and anoints Jesus' feet. Cries or tears wash his feet. And they, she anoints his feet. And Simon the Pharisee is not happy about it. Because she's a sinner. She doesn't know the book. She's not educated. She doesn't have status. Yet she knew what Jesus loved. And so this all happens. And Simon's not happy. 
Jesus turns to Simon the Pharisee. Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You, Simon, didn't give me any water to wash my feet. Yet her tears washed them and she wiped them away with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven because she has loved so much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. See, that's who we are as believers. We're supposed to be as believers. I struggle with it too. It's not easy. It's hard to love some people. I'm hard to love sometimes. Don't, don't say anything like that. I'm hard to love sometimes. But the Jesus in me, the Holy Spirit in me, compels me and teaches me and prods me to love those that are hard to love. Sometimes with compassion, sometimes with mercy, and sometimes with justice. And that's really what I receive from my Savior is that same kind of love. And so, Jonah teaches us to change our disposition to love others, to follow God, to follow His prodding, to follow His direction, even when it doesn't feel right. Even when our mind is saying no, we need to follow what God is prodding us, whispering, nudging us to do. Because he wants what's best for us. So we can here in Clearwater, Safety Harbor, Dunedin. Maybe we can engage people and help to change our life, their life. Change lives because of the compassionate, merciful love that we gain by being believers in Jesus Christ. God loves deeply. He taught us to love deeply. You are loved deeply. You are loved by a Savior deeply. And we love others deeply. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the book of Jonah. We thank you for that prophet. We thank you for his story. We thank you for all that God did in and through him. And we ask you, Lord, to continue to work with us when we are disobedient, or when we will the wrong direction, when we decide to listen to our head over your direction. Help us, Lord, to become the merciful merciful, compassionate, loving people that you desire us to be. Amen? Amen. A little tease for Monday night, since we're going to go into Ruth. Ruth is a beautiful story. It's a story of love and redemption. Uh, there are several characters in the book, but you would make, it makes sense that a book named after Ruth would have a lot of Ruth in it. And it does. But, but somebody else that's significant in that book with her is her mother-in-law, Naomi. And we'll hear a lot about her. And then somebody else that is um, very significant in many ways, not just as her husband-to-be, but more than that, is a man named Boaz. And so we will hear the story of Boaz and, and Ruth. And what we find happening there is that Ruth is pushed, urged to go and be with Boaz on the threshing floor because he's sleeping with his grain because you slept with your grain after you harvested it so that nobody would steal it. So Boaz is sleeping with his grain. And part of why she's doing that is she wants to be a bride. And Boaz is related to Naomi. So there is a term that we will hear in Ruth called a goel, uh, a kinsman redeemer. And Boaz, because um, he is in a position to be that, and um, we'll see more in that, th there's a legal part of that that has to take place. And so that legal part 
uh, we'll have to we'll see the steps that that will take place but what what Boaz tells Ruth that's important to us is he says I will do what is legal I will do what is gracious I will go above and beyond what I am told to do I will make you my own so the key in those things is he always says I will many of us as young children learned now I lay me down to sleep I pray to God my soul to keep if I die before I wake I pray the Lord my soul to take with the understanding God saying I will take you if you die before you, I will take you in West Point uh, there is a cemetery that has a lot of generals, commanders, and war heroes buried. In. But if you look, there is one grave that has two women in that cemetery. These two women were sisters, spinsters, that lived across the Hudson from West Point. And so God gave them the idea that these boys, this is in the mid 1800's, that these boys were going to be gone off, some of them going off to war, never to come back. And so these boys need to be taught about God, about Jesus. And so they would row their boat across the Hudson every Sunday and teach the cadets and the officers Sunday school. And when it became winter and the Hudson would freeze over, the boys would go over and get them and bring them across the ice so that they could teach them Sunday school. They did it every Sunday. Anna and Susan Bartlett were the two ladies. And knowing that some of these boys would never come back once they went off to war, they thought it was important that they teach them something that they could take and never forget. And here's what they taught them. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. But there's a third verse that we usually don't teach and don't sing. And this is the one that they really wanted the cadets and the officers to know. Jesus loves me. He will stay close beside me all the way. And I know that when I die, he will take me home on high. They wanted those boys to know that no matter what happened, God would say, I It was written for them, and we have sung it all of our lives. But there's a grave in the West Point Cemetery for those two ladies. The rest of them are commanders, generals, and war heroes. But maybe the greatest work was done by Anna and Susan Bartlett. See, we can rest because God says, I will. I will send my son to redeem you. I will. Yes, I will. Jesus, will you redeem me? Do you know what I've done? Yes, I will redeem you. Do you know what I've been thinking this week? Yes, I will redeem you. Do you know who I hurt this week? Yes, I do. I will redeem you. No matter where we are, who we've hurt, what stain is on us, Jesus says to us every time, Yes, I will when we ask, will you forgive me? Will you redeem me? Jesus is here saying, yes, I will. Jesus takes us. He will not forget us. And we get to remember that now through Holy Communion. Holy Communion is the night that Jesus was betrayed. It is the night that he broke bread, showing the disciples that his body would be broken. And he said, take and eat this. And we do that here. It is about that. It is about him blessing the wine and giving it to them and saying, this is my blood of the new covenant. 
That new covenant is, yes, I will redeem you. Yes, I will forgive you. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. But you don't know what I've done. Yes, I will. Do you know where I've been? Yes, I will redeem you. So anybody that has any issues with that need lose them. Because all Jesus knows is, yes, I will. So when you come here this morning asking for forgiveness for whatever myriad of things you've done. And when I ask for forgiveness for all those things I've done, some of them this morning, I hear those words. Yes, I will, child. Yes, I will. Rhonda M. Cindy will come first.